All right, tonight we're going to Mike chapter 6. All right, let's uh, pray. Uh, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for this day. Most of all, we thank you for Jesus. Uh, Lord, uh, may we open our hearts to your word. May you open your word to our hearts. Uh, may we uh, gain some knowledge tonight. And uh, Lord, we love you. We just pray all this in the precious name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. All right, Micah 6. God pleads with Israel. I want to just kind of call it this beginning of it's like the great court case. Um, so I'll just read this first. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O oh, you mountains, the Lord's complaint. And you, strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a complaint against his people. And he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent you with Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled. And what Balaam, son of Baor, answered him. From the Acacia Grove to Gilgal. That you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, <clears throat> with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of old? Shall I get my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? The Lord's voice cries to the city, Wisdom shall see your name. Hear the rod who has appointed it, and there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the short measure which is an abomination. Shall I count pure those with the wicked scales and with the bag of deceitful weights for her rich men are full of violence her inhabitants have spoken lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth therefore I will also make you sick by striking you by making you desolate because of your sins you shall eat but not be satisfied hunger shall be in your midst you may carry some away but shall not save them and what you do rescue, I'll give over to the sword. You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread the olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. And make sweet wine, but not drink wine. For the statues on Omri are kept. All the works of Ahab's house are done. And you walk in their counsels, that I may make you a desolation your inhabitants a hissing. Therefore you shall bear the reproach of my people. That's some hardcore stuff there. All right. So God pleads with Israel. Hear now what the Lord says. So Micah uh, is speaking uh, for God you know, as a prophet. Thus saith the Lord, if you will. Um, and arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear what you have to say. So this is a language of a, of a court of law. Um, God is speaking through the prophet. Uh, he orders the people of Judah to rise and present their case, like you know, all rise. Uh, in the scenario uh, that God presents, the people are the plaintiffs, the ones that bring the lawsuit, the ones who claim to have been injured. And God is the defendant, the accused, the one who allegedly injured the plaintiff. God invites the people to address their complaints to the mountains and the hills which have been standing from time of war when Genesis was created the mountains. Heavens and the, the mountains and the hills are well served. 
suited to serve as a witness because they have seen what God and the people have done. They have brought, they have watched throughout his, the history of Israel and Paul. They know that God brought these people into the promised land and gave them victory over their enemies. They have seen the people build altars to pagan gods on high places. The mountains and hills uh, know who is right and who is wrong. Uh, the language in this verse sounds as if God is inviting the people to address the mountains and the hills as if the mountains and the hills constitute the jury. So the mountains and the hills are, are the jury in this trial, if you will. If so, this still poses quite a question. How will the people convince the mountains and the hills of equity in their case when the mountains and hills know otherwise? So we can see, you can look at Deuteronomy uh, 4.26, and it says, I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you this day. And so here's another example of God calling the heavens and the witnesses in Deuteronomy. Um, so verse 2, um, Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. And again, it's um, Micah speaking, delivering the Lord's message. But a God invites the mountains and the foundations of the earth to serve as a jury to determine who has broken the covenant relationship that has existed for centuries between God and Israel. From the bottom of the oceans to the top of the mountains, God's creation has witnessed the relationship between God and, his, and God's people. God's creation is well suited uh, to reach a just verdict in this case. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. Um, God has invited the people of Judah to present their case before the mountains and the foundations of the earth. And now the Lord makes it known that he is prepared to defend himself, whatever accusations the people of Judah might make. But in spite of the controversy, these people are nevertheless his people, God's people. Uh, the covenant relationship has been damaged by unfaithfulness of the people to the covenant. But the covenant of the relationship still stands. When I read that, I, I remember, you know, when God made the uh, covenant with Abraham, you know, he had to put Abraham to sleep and walk between uh, the, the, the bulls um, because Abraham would have broke that covenant. You know, and God never breaks his covenant. So here we see in verse 3. Oh my people, what have I done to you? And how have I worried you? Testify against me. And once again, God commands the people to state their case and tell them how he has wronged them to present their evidence against them. You imagine standing there and going, yeah, God, I'm going to tell you how you've wronged me. I'm glad I'm not that person. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how sometimes we're it can be that way today. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage. So God begins to present the evidence in his favor. His first exhibit uh, is part of their history, uh, which is their off mirror, um, which is the Exodus. Um, note to play on words that uh, God asked if he had wearied the people. Now he answers uh, that he has not wearied them, but has instead brought them up from the land of Egypt and redeemed them from slavery. Um, he has not brought them down, but brought them up. He was not hindered. He was not hindered them, um, but has helped them. Um, and, you know, what has God delivered us from, you know, personally? Um, you know, we've all got personal testimonies of what God's delivered us from. Um, you know, I've got my own, and you know, I've got yours, and still delivering us from today. Um, as I was reading that, that's what I was thinking about the things that God has delivered us from. Sit 
before you, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Also, uh, Yahweh brought them up out of Egypt and redeemed them. Uh, that word for redeemed is padah, uh, from slavery. The word padah has to do with deliverance. Um, God delivered Israel from a land of bondage and led them to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. Uh, they went into Egypt as undistinguished family, with the exception of Joseph, um, and emerged from Egypt as a nation. Um, God parted the water so the Israelites could pass through the sea. So he's reminding them, hey, you know, this is what I've done. And escaped the pursuing soldiers. God had given them water to drink and manna to eat in an arid wilderness through that exodus. God had parted the waters of the Jordan River so they could enter the promised land. It's Joshua 3. Um, every Jewish child, you know, knew these stories. So God is reiterating these stories. Uh, well known to every Jew. God sent you, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now God presents his second exhibit. You know, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, the priest, the prophetess, and the emancipator. Uh, God has favored Israel greatly with these leaders, and many more who are not mentioned here Joshua, David. Uh, and the long list. And as I was thinking about this, I started thinking about um, America and how, you know, God delivered us as a people uh, from the bondage of the Brit British, of the slavery of, of the Britons. And how, uh, you know, God, obviously, Israel uh, is God's holy nation. Um, but God created America. I mean, yeah, his name's on our money. God bless America. Uh, he created it. Um, it, it. People say it's still a godly nation. I don't know. Um, but we spread the gospel around the world. You know, we're the most giving country uh, still today. And you know, as I'm looking at this, and as we start getting in here, and I go down a little rabbit trail here in a second, um, you know, we can relate, you know, this message of what God's doing to Israel and is going to do to Israel to us, and what He's going to do to us. Um, but anyway, uh, so as. I was speaking about Moses and Aaron and Mary, and he also sent us great uh, um, leaders as well uh, throughout history. I'm not a big history buff, but I mean, you know, we can throw out the founding fathers, and and uh, we can also throw out, uh, you know, some, some godly uh, leaders. You know, throw out a black Martin Luther King Jr., uh, you know, who knew Michael very well and quoted Michael. Um, so we've had God send us uh, godly leaders as well. Uh, verse 5. Oh, my people, remember what King Balak of Moab counseled and what Balaam, the son of Baor, answered him from the Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. God's third exhibit seems a bit odd. Yeah, you know, it's not a lot, big story that, you know, we kind of can remember, but. Uh, you know, he could have spoken to Joshua in the Battle of Jericho. He could have mentioned David and Goliath, which we all know. Uh, the story of Balaam and Balaam seems minor by comparison, but uh, perhaps that's intent. Uh, the mention of Balaam and Balaam illustrates uh, the depth of God's involvement with this Israel's history. Uh, for every great story, such as David and Goliath, there are a dozen of smaller stories, uh, such as uh, Balaam and Balaam. Um, you know, uh, you know, Balaam wanted to uh, curse the Israelites, and Balak, you know, went up and he got all these seven altars, and, and he couldn't do anything but uh, proclaim what God put in his mouth, and he was like, bless them, and it just fired him up and irritated him, and all he could ever do was just. I can only say what God puts in my mouth. And uh, uh, 
Balak king of Moab was afraid of the Israelites, so he summoned Balaam to pronounce the curse on Israel. Uh, for I know uh, that whomever you bless is blessed, and from whomever you curse is cursed, is Numbers 22 6. But the Lord intervened so that Balaam blessed the Israelites instead of cursing them. Um, from Shittim to Gai, uh, that you may know the righteous acts of God. Shittim was the Israelites' campsite prior to the crossing of the Jordan River. And Gilgal uh, was the first campsite inside the Promised Land. I think I actually taught on that. Um, I don't remember the name of it. In other words, what happened from Shittim to Gal was that God stopped the waters of the Jordan River so that the people of Israel could cross into the Promised Land. Shittim and Gal uh, serves as shorthand for the miraculous entry into the Promised Land. Verse six: What shall I come before the What shall I come before the Lord and vow myself? So now we're getting a little bit of a facetiousness. Like, what shall I come before the Lord and vow myself before the Most High God? The first proposal. So the central question is what they're like, well, what must I do to please God? Well, what must I do to please you? Uh, so the first proposal is that a worshiper should bring God uh, burnt offerings with your old calves. Uh, there is much to commend uh, this proposition. The first seven chapters of Leviticus are uh, given detailed instructions regarding a variety of offerings that God requires the Israelites to make. The burnt offerings is the first offering mentioned, Leviticus 1, which suggests that it has a special importance. Um, the requirement was for a male without blemish. A calf could be offered as a sacrifice once it was seven days old. This is Leviticus 22, 27. But a truly devoted worshiper would feed and care for the calf until it was a year old and then offer the sacrifice. So a year old calf was the best offering that a worshiper could make. So that's what they're saying. Um, verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with a thousand, with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? So the second proposal escalates the requirements substantially. So obviously they're not going to, I mean, they're like, a thousand rams? What if I get 2,000 oils? Is that going to please you, God? Um, a ram is a male sheep that constitutes an acceptable offering in Leviticus. When Abraham was ready to sacrifice Isaac, the Lord provided a ram to sacrifice in Isaac's place. If one ram is acceptable sacrifice, how about a thousand rams? Must be super acceptable. If the Lord would be pleased with one ram, surely he would love a thousand rams. Of course, we know olive oil was one of Israel's primary agricultural products. Um, it was made by crushing ripe olives uh, to extract the oil. The lesser grades of oil would be extracted by various processes. Uh, but the oil that resulted from the first pressing <laughs> which is the virgin, was considered to be the best. Um, oil was used for cooking lamps and a variety of religious purposes to fuel lamps in the tabernacle and temple to accompany uh, various sacrifices and for anointing. Only the best oil, virgin oil, from the first pressing was acceptable for religious purposes. If the Lord would be pleased with the offering of a small quality of oil, he must be really pleased with a river or 10,000 rivers of oil. Um, the mention of thousands of rams or tens of thousands of oil uh, you know, constitutes you know, just a hyperbole uh, because no one would, could ever afford such a lavish offering. And verse 7 is where we're going to go down the rapid trail. Is that bad? Verse 7. To 
the Thousand River Lord, uh, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? So shall I give my firstborn for my disobedience? For the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. So the third proposal escalates the requirement beyond acceptable limits. The Israelites are familiar with child sacrifice because it is common practice among some of their neighbors. So we know that their neighbors would sacrifice babies. The question proposed here is whether a person would have to go so far as to offering his own firstborn child as a human sacrifice. Jewish law says, you shall give your firstborn sons to me. You shall do otherwise with your cattle and your sheep. Seven days it shall be with its mother, then on the eighth day you shall give it to me. That's an Exodus. Right. However, and this is a big however, the Lord did not require the Israelites to offer their firstborn as sacrifices on the altar. Instead, they were redeemed they were to redeem their firstborn children by the payment of five shekels to the priest. It's Exodus 13, 11 through 15, 34, 19 through 20, and in Numbers. When the Israelites practiced child sacrifice, they typically did to, to Moloch or other gods, not to Yahweh. And Yahweh condemned such practices. In Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Kings, Psalms, and Ezekiel. We must conclude then that offering firstborn as a sacrifice would not please the Lord. Such an offering would constitute a grave sin. Rabbit trail time. All right, so yesterday, uh, I believe Senator Sass proposed uh, a law that would uh, prevent once a baby is born in the United States uh, that from a box of abortion. So they tried to kill the baby, but something happened and they didn't do it. So the baby uh, made it out of the womb and was born. And, you know, the governor of Virginia, uh, uh, the day before he got called out on his uh, little racist thing. Uh, he went on a TV interview and said that uh, that once the mother had birthed the baby, that the doctor would make it comfortable, and then they would have a decision as to what to do with the baby. So we're talking about you know a live baby out of the womb. So we'll have a discussion. If we want to kill it, we'll kill it. You know, no problem. And then the next day, boom, God revealed some sin in his life. Um, but, so Sass introduced this yesterday, and it was, uh, had to get 60 votes, so 53 Republicans voted for it, and 43 Democrats voted against it. So, you know, our lawmakers, we, we vote up there, they're representatives of the people. So, in essence, America just said um, it's okay uh, that if a baby is born uh, through a botched abortion, that it is okay to kill it um, with no ramifications. So, you know, um, you know, here we're going to be talking about justice and how God's just in six uh, eight, um, but you know. Uh, we see throughout here, you know, God's calling out Israel, hey, you know, uh, you're in trouble, you know, if you, um, you know, don't repent and turn. Otherwise, we see it throughout, uh, you know, throughout the, uh, the Bible where, okay, you know, fine, I've tried through my prophets, I've tried to warn you, I've tried to tell you, you're going into captivity, you know, you're going to be destroyed. Um, so as America, uh, you know, we've killed over 50 million, aborted 50 million babies. You know, at some point, God is a just God. You know, at some point, you know, God, we're going to cross over that line. You know, at what point was that point yesterday? 
you know, did we cross over that line and we said, hey, you know what, as a nation, it's okay. You know, this is acceptable to us. So, um, you know, I listen to a lot of prophetic stuff and, you know, God's, you know, when they led astray, God would take them into captivity. And there's when, uh, uh, several prophets, you know, let it be established to a more, um, there were several prophets that have had these visions and this guy kind of compiles them. They have prophets, these, and they're all false prophets in the end times, so don't get me wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, he compiles these, these people don't talk to each other, so when he gets several prophecies and he's like, you know, and he feels the Lord wants them to share them, he puts them on his website. And, uh, you know, some of these prophets are saying that, hey, we're going to be uh, taken over or, or Russia is going to actually you know, uh, capture us at some point in time. And, you know, a lot of people would laugh that off. And, you know, Russia's the size of Texas, you know, but, um, you know, is that going, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, why is America not mentioned in the book of Revelations in the end? Um, well, I mean, are we relevant? You know, where are we? You know, have we, you know, become captive? You know, is that what's coming our way? Just like the Israelites, you know, if we were, if if you know, if we were created, if this nation was created to serve God and go out and and be a godly nation, and we walk away with that from that, just like the Israelites, why are we any different? So you know, now there's still time. I heard today when I was listening, I hadn't listened to a lot of stuff in this past week studying, but uh, today I did hear that the number of people since that came out 30 days ago or whatever about what that guy said, that the number has increased from the people that thought abortion was okay to not okay by 17%. In 30 days, people were like, what? You know, because a lot of people just go on through your life and you just don't, you know, don't realize what's going on. But now that this has come to light, you're like, wait a minute, that's not right. So maybe, you know, we will repent change that. I mean, 17% in 30 days is all a lot. So maybe the more the word gets out, that, that we'll actually turn it and we can change it. You know, in the year 2020, we can change and reverse what's going on. But if we don't, and we continue on, you know, I don't know what the Lord's going to do. But He is just. So, shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? So what, what does God require of us? You know, it's like, what do you want from this Lord? <coughs> Three things. <coughs> to do what is just. To love mercy. Love mercy. Because without mercy, who would be here? You know, God was just. Did what he was supposed to do to us, we wouldn't be here. So we're not only to love or to receive love and mercy. And if we love mercy and love giving out mercy, we'll receive mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. So do what is just, love and mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And there's a lot of people got teaching on Micah. Uh, 6 verse 8 and I believe that's what Martin Luther King uh, Jr. had quoted in one of uh, his uh, speeches um, verse 6 asks what the worshiper or 6 asks what the worshiper must do to please the Lord Six seven suggests various possibilities. 
all of which involve some sort of sacrificial offering. However, the prophet takes the idea of pleasing the Lord in an entirely different direction. He doesn't say that the offering of sacrifices is bad. Uh, such af offerings, after all, are required by Jewish law. However, the focus of this verse is not on external acts, such as offering of sacrifices, but on attitudes that come from the deepest part of a person's life, from the heart, and manifest themselves in positive actions toward God and fellow humans. What does God require of you but to ask, act justly? Mispot in Hebrew, to love mercy, hesed, and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, this verse is an excellent summary of true discipleship because each of these three actions has many ramifications. Um, it's also a good verse to memorize because it says so few words and, and it's so easily understood. To really please God, one must act in positive ways toward other human beings and toward God. The prophet spells out three of those positive actions. So to act justly, justice, mispop, and righteousness, sedaqa, are related. Uh, justice involves bringing people into a right relation with God and each other and these relationships produce righteous lives and God's law provides very specific guidance regarding re regarding to just behavior justice requires witnesses to be honest man where did that go you look up the Capitol Hill today jeez man whatever it is yeah. uh, and impartial Justice, honest and impartial, that's good. It requires fair treatment in courts for all people. Is that what we got today? No. If you're black, is, do you get the same treatment as if you're white? No. If you're a Republican, do you get the same treatment as if you're a Democrat? No. So, you know, when people look at that, or, you know, they look at our judicial system to be the backstop. Um, you know, it's a mess. And why is it a mess? It goes right back to, you know, being ungodly. Right back to taking the Bibles out of the schools. Right back to taking the Ten Commandments off the courthouses. And on and on and on. Taking God away. It requires fair treatment, of course, for all people. All meaning everybody. But that's, we know, that's not the case today. If you're rich, powerful, Democrat, you get away with a lot of things. It requires special consideration for widows, orphans, and vulnerable people. That's in Deuteronomy 24, uh, 17. To love mercy. Has a rich variety of meanings in its kindness, loving kindness, mercy, goodness, faithfulness, or love. When applied to God, as it is fundamentally the expression of his loyalty and devotion to solemn promises attached to the covenant. Um, you know, Jesus said, Blessed are those. Uh, who are merciful, for they will gain mercy. That's what we're supposed to be. If we're merciful, we will, we will get mercy given back to us. You know, lots of times in this life, it's like, hey, you know, uh, I, I heard a story where a guy, they walked in, and uh, it was on Sunday, so you know where this is going, right? He was in a suit, him and his wife, and this lady walked around with a five-gallon bucket of sour cream, spilled it on him, and he was like, hey, you know, you owe me $350 for this suit. Obviously, he had come from church. And uh, the manager was like, hey, you know, okay, okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll have it cleaned up, I want a new suit. 
So they left and the guy wrote him a check. And, uh, you know, but a lot, a lot, and I've heard this before, you know, a lot of, um, you know, did he show mercy? He just came from church. Did he show mercy as a Christian? Of course not. And a lot of uh, food or waitresses on Sundays. You know, what does that say about us as believers? It's, that's horrible. Um, so, you know, if we want mercy, and trust me, we want mercy, we're supposed to give it. So, those that have wronged us, you know, we know that, you know, if you hold on to that, you know, the only thing you're doing is killing yourself. Like, literally. Your blood pressure, uh, you know, your endorphin, I mean, all the, your adrenaline, all that stuff, will, it will eat, eat at you and it will literally kill you. That's why the Bible says, you know, you have to forgive. And if you do not forgive, God will not forgive you. It's bottom line. So if you walk around in unforgiveness, you're not going to be forgiving yourself. You know, and, you know, there's some health benefits. I like that. of the Hesed or mercy are translated steadfast love. There are undeniable elements of mercy and kindness that underlie each of these occurrences. I like the word, Greek word agape in the New Testament. Hesed is a word that involves action, kindness or love as expressed through kind or loving actions rather than just feelings. Um, and to walk humbly uh, with your God. Um, I just was thinking as I was reading through this, I was thinking about uh, the good old song, um, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. And I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Um, the mountain's too high, the valley's too low. I'm down on my knees. Um, and I'm ready to stand. I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Uh, I like that. I like that song. There are two components to walking humbly with our God. First, if we are to please God, we must walk with God. Like Adam, you know, he was walking with God. God must be a significant part of our everyday lives if we're walking with God. A constant companion, a guide, and instead, we must allow God to lead us. You know, how often during the day, you know, do we let, you know, God lead us? Do we ask, you know, and we're supposed to pray for everything. You know, I, I, I for really heard Pastor David pray for where you got gas, you know, and I will, man, that just popped into my head. Uh, I started to work at the uh, food bank in downtown Winston. Well, I don't really want to share this back. I guess I'm going now. Uh, so they're feeding a bunch of people there. I mean, God, they got Hebrew stuff on the walls. Uh, I mean, God's there. I felt it when I walked in the door. And uh, so when you're, you know, working around a bunch of godly people, I mean, they're feeding a lot of people, and it's mostly ministries. So it's the churches that are you know, taking all this food and and uh, distributing this food. Matter of fact, tomorrow's like, or Thursday's like milk day. Like they have it every once in a while. And people literally are, they got to bring a police officer on 109 to stop the traffic to get it. I think it's, surely it's more than that one gallon. But literally, the building don't, like I've got to leave. I can't work there. Uh, because these people are literally coming that far to get, you know, I think it obviously, I mean, if they're walking, standing in there. Two There's two maximum. Two maximum, but two gallons of milk. Um, but anyway, so I'm about run out of gas. There's a gas station in sketchy part of town. So well, I'm looking around, going, you know, I'm thinking, you know, 
I said, Michael, walk up to me. It's why I was like, Lord was preparing for what was fixed to happen. I just didn't know. So I get out, I put it in, I'm like, okay, well, I'm guessing through things here, so you know, just watch this side. And then I said, eh, it's easy for me to just get in trouble. I was sitting in the truck. These people pull up. Uh, he gets out. Um, he's a remodeler or something. Probably works for Mike. But he was, <laughs> his face was all covered up, you know. And uh, you know, he goes in. And next thing I know, there's a, there's a tap on my window. I'm like, you got to be bored. You just kind of <laughs> set me up. I've had that happen before. I'll start thinking these things. And all of a sudden, five minutes later, I'm like, what? But anyway, so there's a girl, she taps on, she says, hey, uh, can I have $2 for gas? And uh, she said, I just sent my boyfriend there with a dollar. Nobody would let me use the phone. And it was raining. And I said, yeah, hold on a second. And, and, you know, I'm not telling you this if I lose my reward or whatever, but I'm telling you this because God just wanted me to do it. Uh, and so I got out and I walked over there. And I said, and I've not done this in a long time. It was just, you know, I think it was just, now, in my opinion, when you're around a bunch of godly people, you know, just, you know, your spirit's kind of, you know, open to things that are uh, going on but anyway. So I looked at her and I said, the only reason why I'm doing this, I said, because I'm a Christian. And I just want to tell you Jesus loves you and I realize you're having a bad day. So I stuck my card in there and I just said, fill it up. And she said, I'm going to cry, you know. And she's going to give you a hug. And I gave her a hug. And then I just popped back in, in the truck, finished pumping gas, did a little back, but it was gone. And, uh, you know, I don't know what, you know, and I was praying, Holy Spirit, wear out. You know, well, why is she in that situation where they only have a dollar? You know, something's going on that should all not be going on, but that's that's not mine. It's God. God will deal with it. But, uh, you know, I just thought that when I mentioned that gas thing, I wasn't even going to mention that about Pastor David, and then that popped in my head. I'm like, I guess I was supposed to share that. But, uh, but you know, that was just, you know, that's what we're supposed to be doing. I hadn't done that in a long time, but God just presented me, kind of wore me, presented me with that. And, uh, you know, that, that, was, uh, that was cool you know, for me personally. And hopefully that will... And I pull up again, I'll be a little more open to it. You know, then I start thinking about the guys, you know, the guys standing on the side of the road. You know, normally I don't, you know, I don't give a drug addict money. Um, but, you know, what if, you know, you stand there, it's like, you know, I need to think about what I, you know, what I need to do. Because, you know, when you're in areas like that, they're really everywhere. Um, but, like, I wasn't going to give her cash. I knew better than that. But, <laughs> Anyway, hopefully that, you know, changed their lives. You know, hopefully at some point in time they'll remember that or she'll remember that or he'll remember that and, and they'll come to the Lord. But anyway, uh, pray about where to get gas or, you know, in our daily walk of the Lord, praying about, I guess, everything that we do um, in our daily walk with God. So God's got to lead us. Uh, second, um, if we're to please God, we must walk humbly with God. And and uh, a pride comes before the fall. God before the fall. You know, God hates uh, God hates pride. And uh, speaking of, uh, I might get into that a little later. But um, a person who walks humbly with God understands that everything that he or she possesses is a gift of God. Um, and the older I get, you know, the more I just, man, what else, you know, what else do I need? Praise God, I got what I got. You know, I don't need anything. Else. Yeah, I like this or that, but hey, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I got enough. If you look at us as America, as a society, you know, we're, yeah, again, I get back to this, this judgment thing. I mean, we're $21 trillion in debt. I think, uh, they say like 30% of the people are behind on their car loans. You know, so we're, we're more, 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 more. You know, gluttonous in all kinds of ways. Um, you know. A person who walks on the God will try to determine 
where God would have him or her go rather than trying to set his or her own direction based on his or her own wisdom. Um, and that's for everything in life. That's what we're supposed to do. You know, if I know some of you have been walking with the Lord your whole lives, so hopefully you're in the uh, position that God originally intended you to be. Um, but for those of us that haven't, I don't know what I was supposed to be. I know where I'm at now. You know, God will meet you where you're at now, but <coughs> if I walk with God my whole life, you know, what what is this, you know, what would God use me to do? You know, I can't answer that question. I'm, maybe it's revealed to us in heaven. I don't know. But we can walk with God now. It's not too late. We can walk with God now, and God can use us, and that's what we're here for, serve God. Serve God, serve others. Uh, to be truly humble, uh, we must give up all pretenses to self-sufficiency as amendments and must instead rely on God as our help and our shield. You know, I mentioned this before, but I look at Carl, you know. You want to talk about somebody that's got a, that relies on God, um, that is, relies on God for self-sufficiency 100%. That would be Carl. You know, we're still physically able. We're guys. We go out and do it. You know, we can make it. Uh, but, you know, if you've got a physical limitation or something like that, and I don't want to be at that place to trust God, you know, um, with everything. That, that is self-sufficiency. That's a difficult one. That's a difficult one. Verse 9. The Lord's voice cries to the city. Wisdom shall see your name. Hear the rod. It's coming. Who has appointed it? That would be God. Verse 9. Hear the rod. Who has appointed Israel felt the rod of God. Did not, did not hear it. God tells them to hear the rod. Both in the sense of the rod as a picture of correction. Correct the discipline of God, and in the sense that the rod can be used as the voice of God Himself. You know, we always hear that spare the rod, spoil the child. It actually is in Proverbs uh, 13 24, a version of that. Um, but, you know, I know that um, I mean, pain gets our attention. You know, I know my dad got my attention. You know, he used to, you know, he didn't spare the rod, but um, I was probably a problem with kids today. If you touch them, you go to jail. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, sometimes I always call it, do you want the slap or do you want the sledgehammer? I guess that's one of my sayings. You know, I just want the, I want the gentle nudge, Lord, please don't give me the sledge. Um, but, man, I kind of thought last year I had a couple of things I think I might have messed up, got the sledgehammer close to it. Wow, okay. That was hardcore, but I got it. He was whipping out the rod. He went over a rod, uh, biblically speaking, you know, it was a shepherd's staff, and then they could use it to beat off the wolves. Um, they could use it to, you know, pull the sheep in. And um, God uses an example here to, as disciplinary. Um, we can rest intently in our sins. And in our stupidities, and anyone who has watched blood shoveling down the most exquisite food as if they did not know what they were eating will admit that we can ignore even pleasure. But pain insists on being attended to. Um, let's see this Lewis here. Oh, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone. To rouse a deaf world. That was C.S. The book was uh, The Problem of Pain. That would be a good book to read. On the short measure, that is abomination, wicked scales, deceitful weights. Uh, God was angry with Israel for plain old cheating in 
money matters. They lied, they stole, they cheated one another for all the sake of making some money off each other. Um, so they were using scales and they had uh, their scales. Um, but they had uh, two sets. They had one set of scales but they had two sets of measuring. So when they would buy something, they would give it. Uh, they would use the the uh, equal uh, measures, and when they would sell something, they would use the uh, short measure. Um, and it was said like uh, I was listening to Chuck Smith, and he said that uh, um, a baker uh, sued the farmer, so they were in court. And he said, man, the farmer's been showing me a pound of butter. I'm getting like 12 ounces now. So the farmer, you know, played his case. He says, well, I got equal scales. I just used the loaf of bread that the baker gave me. <laughs> <laughs> so the baker was short to begin with. I thought that was funny. Um, a rich men are full of violence. The sin of Israel went further than just cheating others in business and commerce. They also made themselves rich through plain violence. Um, so, you know, through plain violence means more like, you know, mob, like a mob mentality. So I looked up, you know, Googled, and was like, Jewish mob. There was 98 people in this thing that were Jewish mobsters back in the day. 98 people that had one of them's name, let's see, uh, Hyman Abrams, Israel Icepick. Right, that was his name, Israel Icepick. And uh, that was just, it was 98 of them listed there of the Jewish mob so I could just see them going around. You know, it said they, they gained, you know, got gains by violence. So they were probably going around beating Rob and stealing me. This is how bad that it had gotten. And God's like calling them out on it. Um, her inhabitants have spoken lies. And their tongue is deceitful uh, in their mouth. Uh, let's go to James 3 real quick. Even so, the tongue is a little member that and boasts great things. See how great a force, see how great a force a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of inequity. The tongue is so set among our members that is, it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on the fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the image of God. Out of the mouth proceed blessings and cursings, brethren. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same open, opening? 
Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Therefore, I will also make you sit by striking you. I mean, remember uh, Ananias, Sapphira, remember Mary uh, that was mentioned up here. You know, she got leprosy uh, by making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat and not be satisfied. Hunger shall be in your midst. You may carry some away, but you're not going to be able to save it. And what you do. I'll give it over to the sword. You shall sow. You work in the field, but you're not going to get anything. You plant it, but it's not going to come up. You shall tread the olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. And make sweet wine, but not drink it. For the statues of Omri are kept, which that was Ahab's father. Horrible worst kings Israel ever had. All the works of Ahab's house are done. And you walk in their council. You walk in that ungodly council. That I may make you a desolation. A, a state of destruction. And your inhabitants a hissing. You know, so they're literally today. You know how many people hissing is hating. You know I shit you. Know, you know, how many people are doing that today to the Jewish nation? You know, just because they're Jews, I, I still just blows my mind. You know, which we know it's just, it's a spiritual thing. You know, poor little little Israel, the whole world's going to come against them in one day. And I mean, now we're seeing anti-Semitism. Wow, you know, it is definitely on the rise. It is insane, and that'll continue you know, until Jesus comes back. Therefore, you shall bear the disappointment of my people. All right. Any questions? Comments? Give them to yourself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And there was a prayer request today. Um, anybody got that on their phone? We'll pray for that. Uh, this is somebody's daughter was having some problems. Seizures. Seizures. As a group, we'll pray for her. Sam Richards' daughter, Crystal. First of you. Okay. Crystal. All right. Uh, Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Uh, Lord, we thank you uh, that we got to get together to spend tonight, learn your word, and hopefully uh, uh, learn something that uh, we can um, take with us out into the world. And uh, Lord, we lift our sister Crystal up. Uh, Lord, that these seizures, uh, they don't know what's causing them. Um, but uh, Lord, you're the great healer. Uh, you are the great physician. And Lord, we just ask uh, in Jesus' name, Lord, that uh, these seizures are gone. And uh, they don't return. Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. And uh, Lord, we just thank you that we get to come to you uh, when things are going bad. And uh, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Especially thank you for your mercy and thank you for your son, Jesus. Um, and Lord, may we give other people uh, mercy uh, as we live, leave here. And uh, Lord, may we uh, walk humbly with you. And uh, Lord, we love you. We just pray in Jesus' name. Amen.